Hey, Cybercrime Junkies. This is your host, David Morrow. Today's episode will be part one of a two-part episode series. We call it Redemption. New insight from the cybercrime godfather, Brett Johnson. We hope you'll enjoy both episodes. There are a lot of life lessons here. This is part one. Brett Johnson never does anything quietly. Or softly. He's hilarious, opinionated, brilliant. He's also a former U.S. most wanted cyber criminal. Brett changed the trajectory of his life after working for the U.S. Secret Service, serving time in federal prison. He now's a good guy who knows exactly how the criminal mind works, especially the cyber criminal mind. It's rare that a cyber criminal actually changes changes their stripes, let alone does so much good for the community that serves and protects individuals, families, and organizations' brands. Brett Johnson's path to reach this positive transformation wasn't an easy one, nor was it an overnight success. It took a lot of work, discipline, and faith, faith in himself, faith in his family, as well as the FBI and related federal law enforcement resources involved. This is his story, the true cybercrime story of Brett Johnson. Lucky to work for a great group of people you really believe in? Find yourself making an impact? Technology is a river that flows through every aspect of an organization, and today is different. We put ourselves and our organizations literally at risk of complete destruction every single time we get online. One click. One distraction is all it takes. Hi, Cybercrime Junkies. This is your host, David Morrow, along with co-host Mark Mosher. Come join us as we explore our research into these blockbuster true crime stories, along with interviews of leaders who built and protect great brands. The criminal mind. When you listen and watch Brett, you will see what we mean. He does nothing half-baked. He has that killer instinct, knows what it's like to be scammed, to be destroyed, and to scam others. He also has the instinct of protection, healing, and genuine benevolent intent, one that helps others in a meaningful way. There are so many life lessons and deeply personal matters which many of us can relate to in our time we spent with Brett. We spoke for hours in these discussions and spent months researching the inner details, reports, and even dark web findings. We broke it up into two parts to give his story the respect it deserves. And we've provided it here in our podcast, Cybercrime Junkies, where we'll cover the following. In part one, we're going to talk about his background, the stories, and the evolution into cybercrime. We're going to discuss Shadow Crew, the cybercrime syndicate that he was the godfather of. And then we're going to look at the final takedown. In episode two, we're going to look at the day it all came tumbling down, the epiphany that changed the trajectory of Brett's life, the family, love, and mentorship that he received, and then we'll reach the point of true redemption. We'll provide today's best practices according to someone who knows the opposite and knows exactly what it's like to stay protected from people like he used to be. Both podcast episodes are thought-provoking and unlike stories most have encountered in our daily lives. It's an extraordinary rare glimpse into the mind of someone larger than life with an exclusive glimpse into how cybercrime reflects upon our society and our own family life. And now the show. Welcome, everybody, to Cybercrime Junkies Podcast. I'm your host, David Morrow. In the studio today is my illustrious co-host, Mark Mosher. Mark, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, Dave. Excellent. So today we are joined by former U.S. Most Wanted cyber criminal turned good guy 
speaker, consultant, writer, podcaster. Great show, Brett Johnson Show. If you haven't caught it, please go there. We'll have links in our show notes. Um, he's now protecting us from the types of people that he used to hang around with and he used to be. <laughs> Uh, with an incredible personality, celebrity status. You could have been an actor, but you wound up here. Uh, <laughs> a devout following, Brett Johnson, welcome to the studio. Man. Yes, it is, it is absolutely my pleasure. I cannot thank you guys enough for inviting me on. I truly appreciate it. Well, we're really, really excited to have you. So, I mean, you've got a color history. We'll get into that. Um, uh, ultimately, the biggest name in cybercrime in the history of the Internet Turned undercover Secret Service guy, get busted, yeah. you get busted, arrest, escapes, <laughs> like repents, changes your life dramatically. You're now on the good side. You're doing a lot of good for a lot of individuals, families, organizations, brands. We cannot wait to learn more. I appreciate that. You you humbled me with what you said. Uh, my yeah, my sister, stuff. about a year ago, she looks at me and she's like, you know, you don't do anything small. You always <laughs> don't do anything small. No, you're not, you're not wired that way, Brett. You're not wired that way. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, you know, the ancient Greeks, right, when somebody would pass away, they used to ask, like, one question, right? Did they have passion? That was, like, the question. That's all that mattered in the life. It wasn't how much money did they have? What, what was their title? What was their job title? It was, like, how were they passionate, right? Were they passionate enough? Did they live yep. life? You're doing it, man. I think I, I am. am. <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're doing it. When you go bad, you go bad. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> when you go good, you go real good. You know, so, it, it is the extremes of those things. It really is. You know, it's, it's the ebbs awesome. and flows, right? It's it the ebbs and flows. Absolutely. So well, I'm just, there's, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll right. tell you, like, my, my therapist tells me all the time, you know, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, <laughs> I want to get right into it. Um, but there's before we do that, my therapist used to tell when I was seeing a therapist, she was trying to get me to go into real estate and stop breaking the law. And I kept telling her, Is there a difference? Yeah. <laughs> Don't those pants cross at some point, right? Do they That's run it. parallel or do they cross? That's How it. does that work? <laughs> right, right. Well, okay. you know, you had you had some history of um, some not always legal dealings before you got into cyber crime. And I, I want to talk about a little bit about that, just so the, the listeners understand this. You had some behavioral patterns there, I believe we would call it, um, before you got into the cyber side, right? Like, uh, I think you, were, you had some frauds and some scams, like charity fraud and fake car accidents, and you were doing some other thing. But the one that always gets me and piques my interest is, um, is at one point were you mining illegal coal? So were you mining man. illegal coal, and how does yes. that? What is that? Tell the listeners. Tell me. So, what is it? You know, I mentioned this, and and I mentioned it in passing on the Lex Friedman show, and he stops me, and he's like, "What did you just say?" So I had to explain <laughs> it. And when I said it, I said, "You know, thirty-six cubic inches. It's a thirty-six by thirty-six inch block. Weighs a ton of coal. Well, actually, it's thirty-nine by thirty-nine, okay. but." And the fact what that happened that, was, do what? The fact that you even know that was. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I was, uh, I was, you know, teen, uh, late teens at this point in time. My mom, she, um, she married this man. His name was Jimmy Branson, and he was a coal miner. He worked for a coal company, and she always had, she always had ambitions. That's a, this woman always was ambitious. So she talks him into quitting his job, going head over heels in debt to get a couple of pieces of heavy equipment in order to mine coal, strip mine it. So, so there's a few different types of, of ways you can mine coal. You can, you can strip mine, which means you uncover the land and dig out the coal there. You can deep mine, which means you burrow into the mountain and bring the coal out like that. You can auger mine, which means you just have a machine that bores the coal out and you don't have to go into the mountain to get it. We were doing illegal strip mining. Now, what makes it illegal, it's called wildcatting. What makes it illegal is you have to get a permit to mine that coal. Well, that permit, back then that permit was like $3,500 or $5,000. That's a lot of money for right. people who don't really have a lot of money. Exactly. So if you don't get the permit, it's called wildcatting. And there's a whole boatload of people that do that in eastern Kentucky. And the way you do it is you you basically find someone who... 
whether they have their own mineral rights or not, you know that coal is on their property. So you'll talk to the guy and you know, you'll pay him so much a ton to bring it out, you know, 30 cents a ton or whatever that is that, that you're paying him. Everyone gets paid along the way. So the neighbors will get paid because you're, you're bringing the coal past them. They'll get so much a ton. All right. Wow. Then you contact a coal tipple, which is where, where legitimate companies take the coal and it goes from there. And you tell, you tell the coal tipple, you know, hey, I've got 19.5 BTU coal. I've got, looks like 300 tons of this that's coming out or however many tons of this it's coming out. It actually be like 2,000 tons per pit. So you, you, you talk to them and you, you arrive at a deal. You know, we'll give you $35 a ton if it is testing out at 21.5 or 19.5 or whatever the BTU is on that. And you have to have a sample of it tested and you take those lab results to the coal tipple. So the, when you actually go to get it out of the ground, it's this big chore because by this point in time, it's it's not rocket science for law enforcement to know that someone is illegally mining coal. You just watch where the damn equipment's going, what neighbors are complaining, and then you kind of listen <laughs> quietly for any explosions up in the head of a hollow someplace. Yeah, and that's something you can be real quiet about. <laughs> exactly. So... Um, what we were doing is is you would wait till on the weekends or you'd wait until late at night and you'd have 30 coal trucks coming up and they would you'd load all the coal up and you'd haul ass out and you'd take the coal to the tipple uh sell it to them and you get a check you know a week two weeks later and that's wildcatting coal now the reason that permits are important is because it's not just the 3500 to 5000 dollars back then for that you know two acre permit it's that you have to reclaim the land after you oh, get through yep. strip mining the coal. And that becomes very expensive. Yep. So unless you've got a huge bankroll and, and you know, you're already very profitable, most people can't afford to do that. And I'm not trying to justify because I know that people are really worried about the environment. I'm worried about the environment when people can pay their bills. People in Eastern yep. Kentucky don't really give a damn about global warming and things like that if you can't put food on the table. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that that's that really is, um, you know, considering that Kentucky mindset, that Eastern Kentucky mindset. I think people don't really it's understand that. It's yeah, about, we're not right. Like it's 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 about survival, and then once it you is. get basic needs, then you can start worrying about bigger things other than yourself. It is like like yeah. and, and not just just to segue for a second, my my uncle. He was involved in these floods that came through a couple of months oh, ago. Oh, wow. Uh, really? He, he, I mean, they, they literally rescued the man as seven feet of water was in his house. Oh, so he loses, yeah. he loses everything, everything, cars, clothing. He's living out of, him and his wife are living out of a white garbage bag right now. Wow. Right? So he, he put the forms into FEMA. FEMA will give you $37,900 as a claim. That's the max they give you. So he puts the forms in. FEMA denies him. And the reason that FEMA denied him is because they he, he was flooded out back in 2016. They gave him money and they said, hey, you have to, from this point on, you have to have flood insurance on the home. Well, that's and hey, that sounds great, right? Yes, you should be you should be required to keep flood insurance until you realize that him and a lot of people in Eastern Kentucky, he's got a a yearly income of eighteen thousand dollars. Right. Flood insurance is four thousand a year. Right. right. Exactly. So how are you going to do that? Yeah. Three three hundred and fifty four hundred bucks a month for flood. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. So that's and that that because of that you get a and that that goes into my history too. And I'm not trying to justify it. Right. But right. You know, if you're not fortunate enough to have a job in Eastern Kentucky, you may be involved in some sort of scam, hustle, fraud, whatever you want to call it. My mom yeah. was kind of the captain of the entire fraud industry. And I mean, this woman, she was ambitious. You know, no crime too big or too small. She uh, at one point, she steals a 108,000 pound Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. At another point, she takes a slip and fall in a convenience store, tries to sue the owner. We had a neighbor she acted as a pimp for. That's mommy. Uh, so I, I grew up in that environment. My dad was a was a helicopter pilot. He was a captain in the U.S. Army. They did the uh, they downsized everything, so they gave him the option of hey, you can either go get busted down to be an enlisted staff sergeant, or you can drop out and go on your private life. And at that point in time, the coal industry was booming, and he yeah. was going to make about double what he would have made in the military. So he he chose that path, and it was just a complete nightmare. And my dad's problem was is he. Uh, 
my dad's problem is, is he had never been abused before. So he enters into a very abusive relationship, doesn't know oh. what the hell that's supposed to look like, what he's supposed to do or anything else. Wow. And at, at the same time, he doesn't, uh, he loves my mom and he doesn't want to, uh, to lose her. So he becomes this enabler guy. Um, it's almost mom, better, better wife syndrome, but it's really not right. just wives. Right? right. It's not just wives. And so my yeah. dad, if, if my mom wanted to commit a crime, right. he exactly. would uh, co-sign on it. And if, if yeah. she wanted to abuse someone, and she did, he wouldn't step in the way. And that was that relationship. Yeah. Hey everyone, we are thrilled to introduce you to a place very close to our heart, blushingintrovert.com, an online store of women's clothing and accessories that make the perfect gift. You see, they're passionate about spreading joy and promoting mental health awareness. Blushingintrovert.com carries cozy women's sweatshirts and quality accessories, journals, handmade gifts and stickers. Everything is in stock, ready to ship directly to your door. Inspired by the calling to give back, a portion of every purchase supports vital mental health initiatives. So your shopping experience with BlushingIntrovert.com truly makes a difference. So come check them out on either Etsy or at their online store at BlushingIntrovert.com and experience the warmth of BlushingIntrovert.com, your happy place. Visit BlushingIntrovert.com today. Well, with that being said, when I had to ask, being a, being a good old Kentucky boy myself, <laughs> I, I had to, I, I'd never heard of that's it. Wow, okay. so thank you for setting me straight. And I, you know, the fact I, I know you went to UK and moved to Lexington. I, you know, I won't hold it against you that you were go big blue. And <laughs> the listeners that don't understand, right? These two universities are about seventy miles apart, and it is a huge interstate rivalry when it comes to college athletics. I mean, they are yes. at each other's throats. We refer to each other as little brother and all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. So, but you no, know, I, I, I still love you. I still got love for you. But it was so not a happy kind of moment when Patino went to U of L. It was right, not right. happy. <laughs> it was so bad. We actually <laughs> stole their basketball coach and brought him over to our side. That's how bad it is. Yes. So. But okay, so with that, that was kind of the genesis that kind of set the track. And then I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of your first, I guess, cyber crimes or foray into cyber criminality. Um, did you, were you selling Beanie Babies on I e- was. Can you so, walk me through that one? Yeah, so <laughs> and, and, I, I heard this. I, yeah, I was curious about this too, because I, I heard this on, on Lex. You, you touched on this on, on, on Lex Friedman's podcast you've talked about it on in, in, in a couple other segments too so i'm sure. dying to hear about this but it okay. involves and social engineering and, and a lot of different pieces yeah. that really and kind if, of set the foundation for what you were about to launch from and what i'll and the way i'll talk about it and the way i talk about it now it's kind of a microcosm of most of the way most scams work online uh now that being said that is of course not my first crime as you pointed <laughs> no, out i, no, I was wildcatting no, coal uh my first crime was shoplifting food for me and my sister, and I just kept going from that point. Um, right. So illegally strip mining coal, insurance fraud, burning homes for cash, faking accidents, faking stolen cars, trafficking drugs, growing marijuana. Um, I mean, you name it. I, yeah. I've had a history and a background in that kind of stuff until I faked a car accident to get the money to get married, move from Hazard, Kentucky to Lexington, Kentucky to go to UK. And I get the worst parts from my mom and my dad. My mom, of course, the criminal mindset, and my dad, I have I have issues <laughs> when it comes to relationships. I've never been able to show love in a healthy way. It always goes overboard. Always. And I'm even today I learn I learn something new every day about a relationship and how you're supposed to be healthy. But Back then, I told my wife, I was like, hey, don't worry about getting a job. I got it. You know, don't worry about the cooking and the cleaning. I got it. So 18-hour class load, 60-hour-a-week job, all the cooking, all the cleaning, something had to give. What gave was the job, of course. Yeah. You know, got to eat. And I was doing these little scams around uh, around Lexington. I had, uh, uh, for example, I had started my own Kiwanis Club at one point oh, no. I, was, uh, I was doing these these charity frogs and stuff like that and not really not really stealing a so, lot of money at all. So, so back up a second. <laughs> how, do you, how do you start a kiwanis like i know what the kiwanis club is i've known okay. involved in several events they have luncheons they have fundraisers 
a lot of older people that are there yeah. people from the yeah. chamber. They gather up. They might play cards. They might have a little trade show. What? What do you, did you just went to space and be like, I'm the Eastern Kentucky Kiwanis Club. I no. use logo, print out a sign. Well, how did you do well, that? What I did was I was I was doing telemarketing and I was uh, first selling tickets for the Shriners Circus, which I, I support the Shriners 100%. They do a great job. Well, once the shir- circus came to town, that job ended and the same telemarketing company, they transitioned over to Kiwanis Club food baskets. So you would call someone up and you'd say, hey, would you like to buy a food basket for the uh, for the food shelter? And you'd sell it for, you'd sell a quarter of a basket for $10 up to a full basket for right. $40. So I wasn't making any money. And I was sitting there, you know, I can do this myself. So what I did was, is I went down <laughs> to the bank. I uh, I faked a uh, business license. I, I printed up one of those. And I printed up everything at the UK computer print center. Right? Computer center. <laughs> the everything. student resource everything. center. <laughs> exactly. Everything. Everything was done there. Oh, so I, man. So I printed out the fake business <laughs> license, took it out of the bank, registered in the name of the Golden Kiwanis uh, Club of Lexington, Kentucky. And you can still look this up. I think there's still a couple of news stories about this. Oh, so man. the Golden Kiwanis Club, and I would just sit at the house and smile and dial. I used the same phone list from the actual... Uh, telemarketing oh, company. So I, I knew the people and right? everything, and I would call them and I would say, "Hey, yeah, I'll come by on Thursday, and I'll pick up your donation. Just make the check out to the Golden Kiwanis Club." So I was doing that, and I was do I, I've been doing it for about a month, and I wasn't really doing really well with it. I was I was stealing some money, but not a lot. What happened was, is I had a pickup in Versailles because in Kentucky it's not Versailles, it's no, Versailles. It's Versailles. Absolutely. So I, I did the pickup in Versailles and I pulled up to this house and I knocked on the door and out pops this guy and he's like, you're with the Kiwanis Club. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's uh-huh. like, I'm with the Kiwanis Club. I'm the president. And I'm like, oh, huh. no. <laughs> oh, and, <laughs> and he's like, as a matter of fact, the cops are coming right now to get you. And I was like, no, they're not because I'm leaving. So, <laughs> I'm not leaving. <laughs> So I, I bug out and I make it about four miles down the highway until I get pulled over and I get charged with, um, what did I get charged with? Theft by deception, uh, yep. a whole host of things. I spent like three months in a county jail, which is interesting because I got out of the county poor jail and that's. Poor prosecutors like, huh, what do we charge? What state? What do we charge this guy? With? What did he right. Like we know that's, it's not right. We just don't have a rule for this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the Lexington News Channel. It made the newspaper. Oh, like wow. So I got out after three months. I was sentenced to a year, but shock probation and all that meant I did three months. So right. I got out after three months and quickly find eBay. And man, I liked wow. eBay a lot. Well, and back in the day, eBay was just the bomb. There wasn't a lot else there. Like, there wasn't there that was. place. Yeah, so, there was no other platform to do that no. kind of stuff. Yeah. That was, you that had was like the genesis of e-commerce, right? That was it. The, uh, like, the two I'm sites like, that you yeah. had. Yeah, like, you had, like, like, like kids when we were watching TV back in the day, like, there was four channels. Everybody was on it. And, like, in the internet back then, like, eBay was it. Like, everyone right. you got online, right. you wanted to shop, you went to eBay. Like, that was it. That was it. The only the, you had the eBay, and then you had Classifieds two thousand dot oh. com was oh, what you yeah. had, and that was it. Uh, you didn't have Craigslist at that time or any crap like that. Oh, yeah. But uh, so what happened was, is I, 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 I huge huge market, huge market. Oh yeah, yeah, huge yeah. huge thing, and and it was, I mean, it was going like wildfire at that point in time. So I was looking, and I was like, damn, there's got to be a way to make some money. Didn't really know how, but I used to watch Bill O'Reilly on Inside Edition before he got involved with, you know, this mm-hmm. Fox News thing and got dismissed. Yeah. He was on Inside Edition, and they were talking about Beanie Babies one night. And I was sitting there watching it like, huh. And they were profiling this one called Peanut the Royal Blue Elephant, selling for $1,500. And here's the thing. I was naive. I'm sitting there thinking, well, shit, I'm in Kentucky. There's got to be one in a bin someplace in one of these little shops around the area. Right. So I skip class the next day, start going around to all the little Hallmark shops and everything. Takes me about three hours to figure out, no idiot, he's on eBay for 1500 But as I figure that out, I do notice that they've got these little gray Beanie Baby elephants for $8. And they're exactly the same. <laughs> they're exactly the same, except the tag reads a different name on it. And I'm like, huh. 
So I buy a gray Beanie Baby Elephant for $8, stop by Kroger on the way home, pick up a pack of Blue Rit dye, go home, try to dye the little guy. <laughs> quickly. <laughs> and I mean quickly find out, hey, idiot, they're made out of polyester. You get them out of the bath, they look like they've got the mange. Are you right? <laughs> I mean, it was bad. I had a five-gallon bucket. I was, I, I bought several packs of this Brit dye, and I dumped it in there, and I would, I would put the animal in there, and it would float to the top. So then you had to get a spatula, and you'd start stuffing it down in the water, hoping it would hold, and you'd pull it out, and you'd see all the ink start to run off, and it's like, shit! So, but the thing is, so now, is I really... Tell me it. Walk me through a transaction. You post it. Do you, now, did you post a picture of this mangy-looking thing, or did no. you... Snip a picture of like the real thing. Found a picture of a real one online. Posted it. it. Lady thought I had uh, the real thing. She wins the bid. Now, here's what's important to realize about most, uh, let's say all cybercrime, financial cybercrime. Financial cybercrime is not successful without social engineering. What you see is as the the more skilled social engineers on the criminal side because there's a difference between the the white hat social engineers and and the yep. black hats on the criminal side what you see is the more skilled players the more skilled social engineer attackers they become social engineers as children in order to survive their environment me example for example i had to know what those adults were thinking and try to manipulate that yep. at a very young age in order to survive and then later I chose to use those tools to victimize other people. So when this lady wins the bid, I don't want to be on the defensive. I don't want to have to respond to her. I want her responding to me. I want to control that conversation. So what I did was, is she wins the bid, and then basically the message was, hey, lady, congratulations, you win. Outstanding. By the way, we've not ever done any business before. I don't even really know if I can trust you. Sorry, but you know what? What we need to do, go down to the United States Postal Service, pick up a couple of money orders totaling $1,500. They're issued by the United States government. They protect you. They protect me. It's a, it, that way the transaction is above board across. Send that to me. As soon as I cash it out, I will send you your animal. Well, she believed that. She sends two money orders over. I cash them out, send her the creature in the mail, immediately get a phone call. I didn't order this. My response, lady, you ordered a blue elephant. I sent you a (laughs) blue-ish elephant. A blue-ish. And now that, that, that one story has so many different things in it. I was just going to say, because that is how the microsoft tech scam tech support scams work right that's most, how most all everything of these, yeah. all of these social engineering scams work like they right. take control of the dialogue they hone in on the specifics of the deal right mm-hmm. and uh there's a lot of lessons within that i mean there's there is so if you think about it the first real lesson that i learned from that is that if you delay a victim long enough A lot of them get exasperated. They throw their hands in the air and walk away. away, And you don't hear from them again. And they don't complain to law enforcement. Right. Which is a big one. That's a huge. That's a big problem with the elderly, with elderly being scammed today. Right. They don't even tell their family because they're embarrassed. Yep. They don't want to say, look, I was a great engineer over at this plant for a number of years. I'm now retired. I can't believe I fell for this. I'm embarrassed. I don't want anybody to know. It's, and 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 part of that, I mean, part of that is also that right? that we're very big about blaming the victims. You know, mm-hmm. we've and we've even got set lines about it. Why would you click on that link? Why would you send right. money to someone you don't know? Who would believe gift cards? Or, right. you know, these <laughs> exactly. So we blame the victim, and it's never the victim's fault that crime is perpetrated upon them. I don't I don't give a damn if somebody leaves their house and they've got the front door wide open. It's not their fault if somebody comes in and robs them. It's the criminal's decision. It's their active choice every step of the way to come in and commit that crime. Yeah. Um, so that's really the first lesson that you learn. But but looking at that Beanie Baby episode like that, what you've got is you've got a victim that is wanting something, something that's very hard to find. It could be a Beanie Baby. It can be uh, a PlayStation 5. It can be romance online, whatever that yeah. is, that thing. That thing tends to 
make it easier for someone like me to get them to react without reason or logic, to get them to, to react emotionally. You know, right. I've got it, you need it. The, uh, you're this. using the amygdala part of your mind, right. not the neocortex, but that is rational thought. Right. And, and also, you got to realize, too, that trust is... I can't defraud anyone unless I get them to trust me. Absolutely. So trust online is is really kind of interesting when you start to think about it. We and typically trust is established through technology, tools, social engineering. Well, technology right. is not just your hardware, it's those websites. People trust PayPal, they trust eBay. They trust these things. So they also trust when I when I gave her that thing of uh, go down to the US Postal Service, it's issued by the United States government. I'm using that as well. Right. as a way to layer trust, to get that potential victim to trust me enough that they give me information, access, data, or in this instance, cash. And you right? had so, a defense of right in the beginning. You said, I don't know if I can trust you. I right. haven't met you, right. right? So you need to establish your trust with me for me to send exactly. you a valuable item. Wow. So you don't you don't even give them the opportunity of, of starting to question whether they trust you. You're just out of the gate right there, done. I don't even mm-hmm. trust you. Who are you? I, we've not done any business before. Right. And you and you immediately get them backpedaling so they don't even have the chance to start questioning anything. Absolutely. You want this item? I've got this item. You've seen a picture of it. It's on eBay. It wouldn't be on eBay if it wasn't legitimate. Go down to the United States Postal Service. It's the United States government that ensures that you're protected and I'm protected, and we'll get this thing done. Yep, and that's the way these things actually operate. Okay, uh, and that's really a microcosm of most every crime or scam that's out there. It's it's just this this little bitty nutshell that kind of explains the way most scams and frauds work online with the trust mechanism, the uh, the, the establishment of uh, you know getting rid of uh, acting out of logic or reason, mm-hmm. all these different elements together. You just reshuffle them and do it with romance fraud or. PS5 fraud or what have you. Well, so was, that, was that kind of the launch pad that really to to getting into cybercrime? I mean, how do you how do you go from Beanie Babies, you know, to the Shadow Crew? <laughs> there's there's well, a whole big journey there. There is, and the way you the way you take that journey, that was the first online crime that I committed. Got away with it kept going. So I and there was there was a situation with autographed baseballs. I Again, Inside Edition gave a lot of inspiration. So another show was Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa autographed baseballs. That prompted a visit to the sports store where I bought an entire case of baseballs, the same <laughs> Kroger to pick up a Sharpie, and I started signing away before I sent them out. Uh, there were all these little instances of that, and I kept getting away with it, but I kept learning as I went along. I got to where I was selling pirated software. Pirated software led into... Uh, of mod chips so you can solder a, a mod chip onto a circuit board of a gaming system and play pirated games you can do it on a cable television box oh yeah we have all whole, the channels yeah we have a whole episode on the espionage yeah. the pirates the whole that was the, me the, I I started doing that. TV, the canadian yep. websites the, all yep. of that yeah so the, the way i got into shadow crew those mod chips eventually led into me programming satellite DSS cards, those 18 inch RCA systems. Yeah. You take the card out of it, program it. Started doing that at about the same time some stupid ass Canadian judge, he ruled that it was legal for Canadian citizens to pirate RCA signals. Uh, He actually said oh he said it in court. He was like RCA doesn't sell the systems, so my citizen can pirate the system the the signals up here. So what happens is, is overnight, you go to uh, sets up a little business in the United States. You go down to Best Buy, buy the system for $100, take it out in the parking lot, open it up, pull the system out, pull the card out, throw the system away, program the card, ship it to Canada, $500 pop. And I started wow. doing that, and I was making a lot of money. Had so many orders, could not fill them all. And quickly, and I do mean quickly, thought to myself, why do I need to fill any of them? Why, yeah, why send anything back? They're in Canada. I'm down here. Who are they going to complain to? So mm-hmm. I didn't fill any of the orders. Stole even more money. I was stealing about $4,000 a week at that point. Wow. And 
I got worried about the funds that were coming in. I thought I was going to be looked at for money laundering. So I uh, figured the best thing that I, that I could do is get a fake driver's license, open up a bank account under that name, launder the money through the account, pull the funds out of the ATM. Yeah, there you no go. idea. Had no idea where to get a fake driver's license. So idiot Brett gets online, starts looking around. Thought I found a guy. Sent him two hundred dollars. Sent him my picture, and the dude rips me off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What you? you yeah. Sent the, you sent somebody you didn't know money, and oh, yeah. you got nothing in return. Yeah. That's yeah. what you. That's what you call karma. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but. Now I, I laugh about it, and I got to tell you, you know, it's um, one of the things with uh, when you're running a, a a crime empire. Eventually, is what happened. You do get scammed, yeah. But the the mindset changes. See, I'm still pissed off today over that initial scam. I, I'm still I still feel the victim on that. Right. But all the all the other you know dozens of times that I got scammed when I was part of Shadow Crew and all those sites like that, I just chalked that up as the cost of doing business. Yeah. Right. But that initial that initial loss, man, I was pissed. I'm still pissed today about it. But back <laughs> then, something. back then I was so angry that the result was ultimately Shadow Crew. If you think about it, so, and I've talked, I don't know if I've spoken to you guys about this before or not, but... There are three necessities to successful online crime. You have to gather data, and that's the PII, that's the credentials, bank account information, things like that. Right. It's also any tools that are used, spoofed phone calls, mimicats, uh, Sox5 proxies, whatever. So you gather data, you commit a crime, and then finally you cash it out. Put literal cash in pocket or you know information access data. Right. One individual can't really do all three things, either because of a skill gap or a problem with geographic location. So right. you have to rely on other people who can do that, who can fill those gaps for you. Before well, Shadow Crew, there's actually... Yeah, I mean, modern-day cybercrime gangs operate that way, too, right? right. right. They, have, they might develop the ransomware code, but they've got affiliates that are going to execute... Do that. Somebody they might hand. Somebody will handle the 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 cryptocurrency exchange, like all of those different right. facets. They they've got groups that handle just the customer service, right? Like the, it's the best customer service in the world. You get. Oh yeah. <laughs> you get the good side of a ransomware attack is is you're about to find out what the best customer service is in the world. Like right. Do anything you want to make that transaction happen. Well, I mean, and you mentioned what? ransomware. Some of it is so damn good. A company gets locked down. Once they pay the ransom, the, the criminals will have someone help restore the data for the company. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's it's like insane. A, yeah, it's like a $300,000 project normally. They're like, right. we'll do it for free. No problem. Yeah, Just yeah we got it. you. <laughs> <laughs> we got you. We, we got it. We got it. We, we are the professionals here. We got this. But back then... Because you do have to network with people. The only avenue you had was IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Yeah, this rolling right. chat board, you got no idea who you're talking to, if you can trust them, if they know what they're talking about, if they've got a product or service, if they've got it, if it works, or if they're just going to rip you off because everyone there is a crook. Yep. What Shadow Crew did, and there's three sites. There's Counterfeit Library, Shadow Crew, and then finally Carter Planet. I built and ran Counterfeit and Shadow Crew. What those two sites specifically did is they gave a trust mechanism for criminals. Now, and it all at the end of the day, everything boils down to trust. All right. Mm -hmm. So, with Shadow Crew, you had a large communication channel, forum type structure, where individuals from different time zones could reference conversations days, weeks, months old, take part in those conversations, learn from, ask questions. You knew by looking at someone's screen name what the skill level of that person was. If you could learn from them, if you could trust that individual, what the entire history of that individual was. We had vouching systems in place, review systems, escrow systems, all with the singular purpose of establishing trust with one criminal and another when they would never meet, not know what each other looked like, never know each other's real name. And that's so that's person, really what lives on today. Those, so I hate to interrupt. What, when Walk the listeners through. These were sites that people could access online, right? right? And what type of things would they offer? Mm. So to me, the, the trust mechanism is the big thing that Shadow Crew did. But Shadow Crew was also the first eBay of criminal 
criminal goods and services. So yeah. it's easier to tell you what we didn't do in than what right. we did. Let's say uh, somebody wanted to get a fake ID. We had fake a, and real IDs. We had fake right. and real passports. We had credit cards. We had new accounts being set up. Uh, if you wanted to launder money, we had the bank accounts, the prepaid debit cards. We had the fintech services as they were coming on, things like that, that we would set up accounts, teach you how to launder money. Um, if you wanted, if you needed some sort of malware, if you need SOX 5 proxies, if you needed, uh, we even had a, a, a section that dealt in capital counterfeit degrees so we had degree mills wow uh, we had a guy that um, a guy over in pakistan his name was mubin this guy you you would give him a name whatever name you would give him and what type of computer test that you wanted on up through ccie and yeah. he would take it in your name and you would get the certificate oh so we would, wow and 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 then we would tell people hey we'll get you the friggin job it's your job to keep it after you get hired right Right. So we we had all these things, anything that you could possibly imagine with financial cybercrime. We had we we dealt in guns. The uh, the only rules that I had was no drugs, no counterfeit currency, and no child pornography. The right. only rule that we ever lived by was no child pornography. Uh, we right. we did end up the last days of Shadow Crew dealing with drugs. We first started with marijuana, then ecstasy, then of course it got into opiates because that's when everything was going uh, hog wild. Uh, yeah. with opiates at that point in time. We dealt with counterfeit currency. We had the super bills coming out of uh, South America, Iran. We had the Thomas Cook's travelers checks. We had the EU super bills at one point. Uh, I mean every single wow. thing. We we were doing um, the dead baby <laughs> method for new identities. That might have wow. caught the attention of law enforcement once you got into currency. <laughs> that you was know? what I was concerned there's, about. There's, there's reasons why you don't want to do child porn, right? We know that. Right. There's reasons why you don't want to mess with currency sometimes, right? Because that elicits a do different that. response from authorities, federal right. authorities, whoever that may be, international authorities. Right. And 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 that was the, that that was why I was my concern at that point in time. We knew the FBI was going to look at us, but I was more concerned with the Secret Service and the counterfeit currency that was going to right. Right. There you go, you're messing go. with That's a currency. You don't want to do that. So, um, but we did end up doing that. And yeah. what got us caught? You're you're right. That did get some law enforcement mm-hmm. attention. Close to the sun. You guys right. are just right. going to the exactly. close exactly. to the sun. But what yeah. really got us. We were we were the first group that really started phishing at scale. All right. Mm-hmm. So back then, when you launched a phishing attack, you could ask somebody twenty different fields, and they would fill out everything: mother's maiden, driver's license, all the passwords, the bank account numbers, the PIN, yeah. the card. I mean, everything across the board. Wow. So we were getting the PINs and the card numbers. The only thing you could do with that was CNP, card not present uh, fraud. So you'd find a, a laptop online, you'd buy it, you'd get it shipped to a drop address, and you'd list it on eBay at 80% of retail, and that's how you would make money. And those carters at that point, a good carter would profit thirty to $40,000 a month. Good wow. money. All right? What happened, though, because we were getting the pins and we were getting the card numbers, you always were looking at ways to encode a counterfeit card and take it to an ATM to pull cash out. Oh. What the what the Ukrainians found is that, so on the back of those debit cards or, or credit cards, that magnetic stripe, you've got three yeah. data tracks. You've got the first data track is the customer's name. Mm-hmm. Second data track is the card number. There's a forward slash, then a 16 digit algorithm out beside of that. Third data track is indiscriminate data. No one uses it. What you're looking for is you're looking for complete track two data. That allows you to swipe the card and make the transaction in person, either at an ATM or at a retail merchant. So what we found out or what the Ukrainians found out is that none of the banks at that point in time had implemented the hash. And what that meant was we had the card number, we had the PIN. You take the card number, a forward slash, put any 16 digits out the side of it, it would encode. You could take it to an ATM, start pulling money out. Wow. And that is what got law enforcement attention because at that point, that thirty to forty thousand dollars a month turns into thirty to forty thousand dollars a day for wow. thousands of criminals. And that gets wow a lot of attention really right. quickly. 
So that's what happened. Man. So this will wrap up episode one of this two-part series here. In part two of this episode series, we will look into Albert Gonzalez, who went by the online moniker Soup Nazi and Johnny Kumba, and who would often dress like a woman from head to toe as a disguise used when cashing out fraudulent cards at ATM machines, racking up millions of dollars in stolen cash. Then one day he was caught in the act and the crack in the foundation for Shadow Crew occurred. It all came crumbling down. We will explore in episode two the massive takedown of Shadow Crew, making international news for years after the fateful day on Sunday, October 26, 2004, involving law enforcement's unified coordination throughout six countries in six hours, leading ultimately to the arrest of nearly 50 core Shadow Crew members. We will also discuss and explore with Brett the aftermath and how Brett Johnson transformed and rose like a phoenix from the ashes of those dark days. The next episode will be released in the coming days, so make sure to download and subscribe. Click that bell on our YouTube channel, Cybercrime Junkies, to be notified when it comes out. I'm your host, David Morrow, and as always, thanks for listening. Hi, Cybercrime Junkies. Thanks for listening. Got a question you want us to address on an episode? Reach out to us at cybercrimejunkies.com. We explore why cybercrime grows daily, how it is funded, productized, and organized, how to protect yourself, and where cybercrime goes to hide. And thanks for being a cybercrime junkie.